Good morning, my name is Misty and I will be your conference operator today. I would like to welcome everyone to the TD the next third quarter fiscal 2021 earnings call. Today's call is being recorded and all lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. At this time for opening remarks, I would like to pass the call over to Liz Morelli, Head of Investor Relations. Liz, you may begin. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's call. With me today are Rich Hume, CEO, and Marshall Witt, CFO. Before we continue, let me remind everyone that today's discussion contains forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws, including predictions, estimates, projections, or other statements about future events, including the benefits of the merger to our various stakeholders, IT spending, demand, supply, expenses, and growth. Actual results may differ materially from those mentioned in these forward-looking statements as a result of risks and uncertainties discussed in today's earnings release, in the Form 8K we filed today, and in the risk factors section of our Form 10K and our other reports and filings with the SEC. We do not intend to update any forward-looking statements. Also, during this call, we will reference certain non-GAAP financial information. Reconciliations of GAAP to non-GAAP results are included in our earnings press release and the related Form 8K available on our investor relations website, ir.synex.com. This conference call is the property of TD Synex and may not be recorded or rebroadcast without our permission. I will now turn the call over to Marshall. Marshall? Thanks, Liz, and thanks to everyone who's joined us today for the call. I will begin today by reviewing the legacy Cinex results and drivers for the fiscal third quarter ended August 31st. Given our merger close date of September 1st, all discussion and outlook for fiscal Q4 reflects a full quarter of combined TD Cinex, and we will continue to use the Cinex fiscal year end on November 30th going forward. Moving to the legacy Cinex fiscal Q3 results, I'd like to point out that year-over-year comparisons I will reference today are impacted by both the unusually strong performance we experienced a year ago, given the rapid adoption of work and learn from home trends during the pandemic, and the supply constraints currently impacting our industry. Revenue came in at $5.2 billion, reflecting a slight decline from the prior year due to ongoing industry supply chain constraints. As we indicated during our June earnings call, we expected the impact from these constraints to fiscal Q3 revenue would be 150 to 200 million. While demand in the quarter continued to be very strong, the impacts from the industry supply chain shortages were higher than anticipated. While it's difficult to quantify with precision, we believe the impact to our Q3 revenue most likely came in between 200 and 300 million. Demand in the quarter continued to be robust and fairly broad based and we saw particular strength in commercial software, networking, security, and notebooks. Our manufacturing business results were consistent with expectations. Gross profit of $313 million increased $15 million, or 5%, compared to the prior year, and gross margin was 6%, up from 5.6% in the prior year. Total adjusted SG&A expense was $144 million, down 3% year-over-year, and represented 2.8% of revenue. Non-GAAP operating income was $168 million and improved by $20 million, or 13% versus the prior year, and non-GAAP operating margin was 3.23%, up 43 basis points year-over-year. Q3 interest expense and finance charges were $26 million, and the effective tax rate was 25%. Interest expense was higher due to the pre-funding of $2.5 billion of bonds on August 9th. Total non-GAAP income from continuing operations was $112 million, up $15 million, and improved by 15% over the prior year, and non-GAAP diluted EPS from continuing operations was $2.14, up from $1.88 in the prior year. Now turning to the balance sheet, we ended the quarter with cash and cash equivalents of $4.05 billion, and debt of $4.03 billion, which also reflects $2.5 billion of bonds related to the merger, which I spoke to previously. 
accounts receivable totaled approximately $2.2 billion, down 20% year over year, and inventories totaled approximately $2.9 billion, up 7% from the prior year. Our cash conversion cycle for the third quarter was 32 days and improving by one day from the prior year. Cash used in operations was approximately $56 million in the quarter. We are pleased to report that our board of directors has approved a quarterly cash dividend of $0.20 cents per common share for the current quarter. The dividend is expected to be paid on October 29, 2021, to stockholders of record as of the close of business on October 15, 2021. Now, moving to our outlook for fiscal Q4, which is reflective of the combined TD Cenex company. Total revenue is expected to be in the range of $15 billion to $16 billion. Distribution revenue is expected to grow low to mid-single digits year over year, and in line with historical seasonal trends quarter over quarter, despite a supply chain headwind of approximately 4%. Our manufacturing business is expected to decline year over year due to a strong performance in Q4 of fiscal 2020. This business is lumpy and is also experiencing supply chain constraints. Our approach remains consistent with prior guidance, which is that we guide towards the lower end of expected outcomes for the manufacturing business. Non-GAAP net income is expected to be in the range of $242 million to $272 million, and non-GAAP diluted EPS is expected to be in the range of $2.50 to $2.80 per diluted share on a weighted average shares outstanding basis of approximately $96.2 million. Non-GAAP interest expense is expected to be approximately $40 million, and we expect non-GAAP tax rate to be approximately 25%. Please note that these statements regarding our expectations for our fiscal fourth quarter 2021 are forward-looking and that our results may differ materially. I will now turn the call over to Rich. Thank you, Marshall, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We've certainly accomplished a lot in the last six months. I am privileged to join you today on behalf of the new TD Cynics and our more than 22,000 coworkers around the world. Since our official day one earlier this month, we've been hard at work, rolling out our new organizational structure and laying the groundwork for our future combined company. We've announced our executive leadership team comprised of seasoned leaders from both legacy companies. And thanks to our robust planning and integration efforts, we have hit the ground running on post day one goals and objectives. However, we have much to do, and I look forward to sharing updates with you as we progress. We are energized by the positive feedback from our customers and vendors and are well positioned to raise the bar on the value we provide to our partners. Those opportunities are reflected in our new name and logo. Our new name, TD Cinex, reflects and preserves the long-standing legacies of our two great companies. Our logo, the Nautilus, is a symbol of growth, expansion, and renewal. For us, we expect growth and expansion will occur in many dimensions, including the growth of our business and our partner relationships. We also announced our new shared purpose, mission, vision, and values for our coworkers, many of whom I have gotten the opportunity to get to know better in this past month. With each meeting, I come away even more impressed with their collective talent, motivation, and commitment to excellence. Although still largely working remotely, we are united behind our vision of connecting the global IT ecosystem and unlocking its potential for all. As we enter our fiscal Q4, we have much to be optimistic about. Our role in the IT industry continues to increase in importance. Our product and services portfolio is tied to some of the highest growth technology markets, such as cloud, security, big data and analytics, Internet of Things, mobility, and everything as a service. As TD Cynix, we have an incremental opportunity to offer our expanded portfolio to our more than 150,000 customers and expand globally 
as we bring our enhanced portfolio to the markets that we serve. From a macroeconomic perspective, we are maintaining a sense of cautious optimism as the recovery from our global pandemic continues to be uneven by geography and industry. For our industry in particular, we believe in the long-term drivers for IT spending, but continue to see a supply-constrained environment for at least the next few quarters. For Q4, as Marshall noted, the distribution business is robust and on track for a normal seasonality from a sequential perspective and low to mid single digit growth year over year. We see strong demand across PC ecosystem products, advanced solutions, and next generation technologies. We continue to see a significant backlog level on a combined basis. We estimate this impact to represent an approximate 4% headwind to revenue, though we still believe in a robust demand picture based on discussions with our vendor partners and customers. From a merger perspective, we are on track and committed to achieving $100 million of cost synergies and a 25% non-GAAP EPS accretion over the next 12 months. We are optimistic that we can exceed our year one accretion targets. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks today, now the real work begins. We are primed and ready for the task of integrating our two great companies and will leverage our wealth of experience in this area. As we contemplate changes and come to decisions on our integration journey, our focus is on establishing and maintaining a superior experience for our customers and vendor partners. Among our top objectives is the harmonization of various IT systems, applications, and tools in the Americas. In closing, I'd like to thank all my TD Cynics coworkers for their dedication and focus during the lead up to our merger close and for their spirit of collaboration and participation as we move forward together. The opportunities ahead of us are boundless. I look forward to meeting with our investors and analysts in the coming months, sharing our vision of the future of the IT ecosystem and keeping you updated on our integration progress. We will now take questions. Operator? At this time, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star yeah. number 1. Your first question comes from the line of Adam Tindall with Raymond James. Okay, thanks. Good morning, and congrats on closing the deal. Um, I just wanted to start with uh, some of the guidance that we're getting here, first on revenue in Q4. So I looked at the 8K, and thanks for, for giving that historical tech data information. I think tech data was about $11 billion of revenue in Q4 of last year. We know Synex Core was $6 billion. So combined, $17 billion, but if we look at the guidance, it's $15.5 billion at the midpoint. Um, just wondering what I'm missing here. I know you talked about uh, you know some of the changes in Hive and tough comps, but it's hard to explain the full delta based on that. Maybe you can touch on any dis-synergies that you're learning about at the vendor or customer level, if any. Hey, Adam, this is Marshall. I'll start, and then Rich can chime in. Um, yeah, we're happy to provide that 8K. Um, keep in mind that those quarters, legacy tech data, are not our quarters. In, in regards to November year-end measurement. So depending on which quarter you pick, you will get a different outcome. I, I'd focus on Rich's comments around Q4 and his seasonal uh, discussion and year-over-year -year discussions on growth rates, I think that's, that's where you should focus on. As in my prepared remarks, I did discuss um, Hive and its impact on Q3 and Q4. Um, it's down year-over-year. -year. That's probably one of the elements that could be uh, skewing the overall relationship. But fundamentally, from a distribution standpoint, the, re the relationships are sound and pretty typical of what we've seen in the past. Yeah, uh, it's Rich, Adam. Uh, good morning. I hope you're doing well. A couple of things in single digit for the uh, distribution business, so you should take that as fact. The second piece is that uh, we are facing a 4% headwind due to 
uh, the supply challenges uh, year on year or sequentially, uh, you know, the backlog is getting bigger for sure. And then the third piece that I would comment on the tail end of your question, um, you know, we, we are not anticipating nor have we seen negative revenue synergies associated with, um, you know, our merger. In fact, we have seen as we had uh, commented at the time of the announcement, uh, uh, even from day one and, and beyond, actually use of the complementary line cards for both sales teams. So we, we see, uh, you know, those opportunities beginning to emerge. Got it. That's helpful clarification. Thanks, Rich. And Marshall, maybe just as a follow-up, you, you went over cash and debt levels. I just want to make sure I'm getting true uh, current uh, leverage uh, levels on, on a pro forma basis. And if you could also uh, touch on how you think about normalized free cash flow for the combined entity and capital allocation priorities, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. That's a mouthful. I'll try to get all three in. Uh, leverage standpoint, we, we still think we're going to be in that, that two, and a, two and a half to three times leverage. Uh, we're still going through the opening balance sheet review. We'll have better visibility to that once we get through the quarter itself. But no difference than what we had said when we were looking at the deal and came out and announced what that looked like back in March when we announced the, the, the merger. Um, from a cash perspective, we also did say that after the second year, our expectation is we'll have a pro forma free cash flow approaching a billion dollars. Clearly, a lot of that has to do with the momentum that both organizations bring together and the, the synergies that we believe we're going to achieve, which is $100 million in the first year and $200 million in the second year. And, Adam, your last point on capital allocation, um, we are building from the ground up what this organization will look like. We're 28 days into the merger. Um, but trust us, as we get through the rest of this quarter, we're going to have a good sense of what that looks like for FY22, and we'll be able to speak to that in our call post-close for Q4. Yep. Sounds like you'll have a lot of options. Thank you. Your next question is from Shannon Cross with Cross Research. Uh, thank you very much. Rich, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, the, the growth at tech data and what you're seeing, um, you know, sustainability and and that um, during the last quarter, maybe if you can give us some, some background, even going back a bit further, um, just in terms of what, what big trends you're focused on, again, on the tech data side as opposed to the Cynic side. Yeah, so uh, my reflection would be fairly consistent with what we had seen on, on the legacy Cynic side. So um, our industry and distribution and the business partner ecosystem have all benefited from the work from home scenario, you know, over the past year and a year to year and a half in total. So there's been some very positive trends there. While at the same time in the early phases of COVID, the data center category uh, was slower for obvious reasons. There's a lot of project based work that takes place there. And then, you know, the next generation technologies as a service category. Um, you know, was very robust, uh, you know, over the last year and a half time frame. As we look forward, I, I believe that uh, uh, although demand is still exceedingly strong in the PC ecosystem, through time that will begin to moderate a bit, uh, you know, based on, on, you know, that whole cycle. But we would anticipate seeing the data center category being more robust in fact, we see it already uh, moving forward as some of that pent-up demand, uh, you know, begins to emerge and has to be dispositioned by uh, the market. And, of course, uh, we'll continue to see accelerated uh, growth in the next-generation uh, cloud-as-a-service technologies moving forward. So that's how I would su summarize it, Shannon. Okay. And then on the financing business that you recently added, can you talk a bit about the magnitude of what you see that growing to, or, you know, was this, this something that some customers were asking for, and so you you decided it was a good use of capital? Thank you. Shannon, this is Marshall. You broke up at the very beginning. Did you say financing business? Yes, I did. For TD Capital? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I'll start and then Rich can chime in. Certainly that's a growing aspect of both organizations coming together. You know, we believe we have to be prepared to address the way the demand in the market's going to go. Um, and we clearly know that we can take a portion of that risk on our balance sheet. We also know that we need to partner with others. Um, as we see that, um, that economic solution continue to be a meaningful part of what we need to do to satisfy our customers' needs. So, uh, Which, was this a, uh, okay, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Shannon. No, go ahead, please. I was just saying, was, is this a response to the shift more and more to cloud and as a service and subscription and all of that, or was this something, I mean, a, a number of the hardware companies and your partners and might have had financing businesses for years, so I'm just wondering thought process. Thank you. Yeah, so, Shannon, I would, I would comment both. Obviously, uh, you know, this is something that provides advantage to the core, but as we look forward uh, to cloud and the as-a-service, it becomes a meaningful part of the entire value proposition, um, you know, that, that cus uh, customers and are, are looking for. So they're looking for, you know, sort of an end-to-end -end solution, kind of think of it as almost a life cycle type of thing. So we do, we do believe that the financing is a critical element to our go-forward strategy. Shannon, I just add one more thing to that. Um, you know, talking about early days in the merger, uh, Legacy Tech Data has a very robust solution that uh, we're planning to deploy globally. So there's a lot of momentum potential behind this offering. Great. Thank you very much. Your next question is from Jim Suga with Citigroup. Thank you. On your prepared comments, you mentioned a 4% headwind. Um, I just want to make sure that's solely due to component uh, con constraints and shortages, and that's a year-over-year -year number as opposed to quarter-over-quarter. -quarter. Just help me clarify and understand if I'm off on that. Yes, Jim, this is Rich. Uh, good morning to you. Um, a, a couple of things. So first, it is a year-over-year -year number. Um, second, uh, when we take a look at the backlog of the business, it continues to grow. Third, it's fairly pervasive. It's not limited to one technology or another. We have backlog in what I would call the PC ecosystem segment, the advanced solution segment as well. Uh, as well as our, our components business. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's our, our best portrayal right now of, uh, you know, how we are. Question is from the line of Matt Sheeran with Stiefel. Uh, yes, uh, thank you and good morning. Um, uh, just uh, again uh, regarding the, um, the the constraints that you're seeing, uh, uh, Rich. Uh, um, it sounds like it is across the board, um, but have you seen that that gotten worse? And as you look uh, into uh, as you get into fiscal 22, uh, are you anticipating that to, to remain the same? Are you seeing any signs of, of easing there? Yeah, so Matt, obviously our intelligence is as 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 good as uh, it is as we work with our our vendor partners to get that insight. And you know, I would say that anecdotally, the the statements run from yes, there will be an impact to the first half of the year, and, and could continue to uh, provide some level of impact in the back half of the year. So you know, I, I believe that. Uh, they're uh, improving upon the situation, and my my crystal ball would be that they'll continue to sort of improve on the situation as we move through time, but this will not be a light switch flip, but rather sort of a, a gradual, um, a gradual hopefully reduction in, in the backlog as, as we move forward. Uh, again, we're working very closely with uh, each of the vendors to make sure that uh, 
we're providing clarity in terms of our demands and you know where we're short and in working with them to help alleviate that as we move through time. Okay, thank you. And, and a couple of uh, modeling questions, uh, Marshall, uh, looking forward. Uh, one is just on, on gross margin. It looks like just from the tech data uh, uh, financials uh, that you provided, it looks like gross margin is similar, but I know uh, there's a lot of mixed shifts uh, seasonally for both companies. So uh, how should we be thinking about uh, gross margin and, and SG&A? And as you, you know, uh, proceed into fiscal 22, can we get an idea of the cadence of that $100 million in synergies cuts um, and when we expect uh, to see that? Sure. Matt, as you know, we don't guide to GM, but I will say that the the results from legacy CENEX for Q3 was positive, so we were happy to see the result. We, we think that there is some confidence that that could continue going forward. Um, and as you can see from the the uh, AK we filed with a historical PD um, quarterly data that the margin profile between the two companies from a gross margin perspective historically is pretty consistent. Um, in regards to sg &A, it's a good question. Um, a lot of our investments that both companies have been done historically have increased sg &A, but but for the purpose of having good outcomes and returns um, going forward in the, in the subsequent quarters. I would use uh, a three and a half to four percent range if you're if you're just thinking about what that might look like for the rest of 21 and then 22, and then in regards to the cadence and, and how the 100 million plays out, we'll work to build that out. Um, we do expect some lumpiness throughout the, the year. Um, there could be some some back end synergy momentum and some some lighter synergies earlier on in the year, but we'll figure that out. And when we talk to you at the at the end of our Q4 and part of our discussion on earnings. We'll give you a little more sense of what that looks like for fiscal 22 by quarter. Okay, okay great. And just just lastly, Rich, if I could just talk, uh, if you could talk about you know, what you're seeing um, by region. Um, you did say earlier that you know there's some uneven um, you know demand trends uh, by region, and obviously you're much global, a bigger you know, global company now that you're combined. Uh, and going forward, you know, will we be able to see uh, the, the results by region and, and perhaps operating results by region as well? Yeah, so uh, we will be publishing the results by region as we move forward, Matt. What I would tell you is this global picture of, of you know, uh, work from home and it fueling a pretty good opportunity that continues is a, a global theme. And this, this idea of... Um, you know, the data center uh, having a, a bit of a pent-up view is also a, a global piece. I mean, obviously, COVID took the world home, and now uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of that data center capability either is requiring more capacity or is requiring a refresh. And, you know, arguably there is a big, big pause in that for, you know, the first – year of COVID, uh, albeit that it is now recovering, as I had said earlier. What I would tell you where you see a little bit of unevenness is when you run into pockets of, of pandemic concentrated issues. You know, I, I guess a great example of that might be like in India, where not now, but in previous months, you know, you see a, a, a big big pause um, or in some of the other uh, Asian countries. So I would say that the overall global picture is fairly consistent, but the, sh the, the short um, or long might be dictated by where a specific country is within the evolution um, of the pandemic. Okay, great. So thanks a lot. Uh, but I, it's clear, Matt, that we have growth and backlog everywhere. Got it. Your next question is from the line of Ananda Barua with Luke Capsule. Hey guys, uh, yeah, congrats on uh, congrats on everything, and thanks for taking the questions. I got two quick ones, if I could. Uh, the first, Rich, you mentioned, I think it was during the fair remarks. Uh, actually, it may have been to it to an answer in Q and A um, with regards to the sales team. You know, already starting to. Uh, to get value out of the combined using the combined line cards, 
do you do you also think uh, is there an expectation or a belief that that you guys could also gain supplier share from key suppliers? Um, you know, and what might that dynamic look like? And then I have a quick follow up from Marshall. So, um, I hope I understand your your question uh, correctly. But I think uh, what we've seen is that uh, very early early on is that customers of legacy Cinex and customers of legacy tech data are interested in us supporting line cards that we historically haven't had. It, it literally showed on day one where we had requests for um, things that, um, that legacy Cinex carried that we did not and vice versa. So I think that that's an early indicator that we'll be able to, um, you know, with the extension of the line card, be able to bring better service to our customers, which in turn, you know, should should lead to, um, you know, a good sales opportunity and revenue opportunity for us as we move through time. And just realize that, um, you know, right now these requests are coming while we aren't fully system capable with each other's line card, certainly we'll get there in a short period of time. But, you know, cus customer awareness is pretty good relative to things that, uh, you know, the other, you know, one or the other side has. So I would, I would suggest that that, that should lead to a, a good opportunity for us moving forward. That, that sounds exciting. And I guess just to clarify my, what my question was, is I remember at one point in time, you know, in two-tier, there to, to some extent with the dynamic where, you know, suppliers, you know, may apportion uh, certain, certain amounts of supply kind of, you know, across the board in, in various proportions. And then if, if, you know, sort of two-tier distributors could – Overperform or show that they consistently overperform those targets, they would get, you know, a portion more supply. And so that was really the question um, in, in that regard. Is that a dynamic that that still exists, or was I misinterpreting it, you know, sort of uh, from the time that, uh, that I was aware of it? Thanks. So I'm going to put my vendor hat on back when I was working with a vendor, and, and the only time that um, perhaps supply would be apportioned is, to the extent you were in a constrained environment, and usually what you try to do is to be fair to your, you know, to all of your customers. Um, you know, I I would anticipate that if we have real demand in a steady state environment, that we'll get strong support from uh, our vendors to fulfill that requirement. I'm I'm pretty confident in that. That that's really helpful. Thanks for clearing that up. And Marshall, just just real quick. Anything with regard to uh, debt pay down, you know, cadence uh, that we should calibrate our expectations to? Yeah, and on the, doubling back on, on the question that Adam had, same answer here. You know, we are IG rated, so with that, we're, we're going to be mindful of the balance and the need to make sure, sure that leverage right. stays, we'll call it properly balanced. Um, uh, and as we committed to that, two, two to two and a half times leverage in the, in the next 12 to 18 months is our, is our goal. Um, clearly with that, depending on growth and free cash flow and working capital needs and other investments and part of our business, that will all get balanced. But, but ultimately that's our, that's our thought is that the free cash flow we spin out, you know, we're going to certainly allocate a portion to debt, a uh, portion to reinvesting back into business, M&A opportunities, and then the dividend that we announced today clearly is a part of that, and then our open uh, repurchase program. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. You're questions welcome. from the line of Group Blue, Barchera with Bank of America. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Congrats on the quarter. I have two questions, and I apologize if they've been asked. I just uh, joined the call late. But, uh, Rich, you know, you've talked about cross-selling opportunities between Synex and, and Tech Data, but I don't think, I, or I, at least I don't know if you've quantified any revenue synergy target uh, between the two companies, I think you've talked about 100 million in cost synergies. But I would think, you know, two big organizations, you, you must have some revenue synergies uh, that are possible. So, so any any thoughts on that? Yeah. So first, uh, I agree with you that 
I believe we're going to have the opportunity to have uh, positive revenue synergies as we move forward. Second, as a matter of form, when you create a business case, uh, as we had for our, our combined TD Cynics going forward, we didn't rely upon positive re revenue synergies in that business case. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a typical market paradigm because they're always hard to uh, quantify. So we see them as a sort of a incremental opportunity as we move forward. And, you know, most important to us right now is to make sure that we're serving those needs. Um, and as Marshall had indicated, you know, maybe we'll get closer to quantifying those as we look at our uh, full year 22 um, and moving forward. Uh, but as I said earlier, it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity that we hadn't relied upon in the business case. Got it. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Uh, for, for my second question, can I ask you about the Hive business? I mean, it's a, it's a great business. It's more on the EMS side, manufacturing side. I mean, at, under Cinex, it was uh, a very significant you know, business, but given the size of the revenues for the combined TD Cinex, I mean, it's, it's probably less significant now, but still, you know, it's a significant business. What is your long-term thought on that business? Is this something that you think is an integral part of TD Cinex, or do you think that this is a business that potentially you could have some kind of a spin-off or, or, or could be divested at some point or, or spun off? But uh, so, just your your thoughts on how how integrated this business is into the combined company and your long-term thoughts for that? Briefly, this is Marshall. Yeah, it, it continues to be a meaningful part of our strategy today and going forward. As you know, we're uh, we're still building out and diversifying the customer base. Uh, building out and creating new solutions to help diversify our, our portfolio of what we provide to our customers. And then going forward, it's still going to be a, an important aspect of our go-to-market strategy and a very critical part of our success as an overall TD Cynix organization. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. And if I can, sorry, uh, sneak one more in. Uh, Rich, before the merger, when you before you, you went private, actually, you, you, know, you had laid out a certain digital transformation plan for tech data. Now that the two companies have merged, I mean, is that plan still in place in terms of the, the, the expenditure on that or and in terms of the, the different, you know, steps you had in that process, or has that changed somewhat? So first, uh, we are fully committed to providing an outstanding customer and coworker experience, a customer vendor and coworker experience with uh, transforming our business digitally through time. So that's a given. The second piece is we have now, uh, relative to our, our TD uh, legacy, we have a whole new pool of a assets uh, to consider. So the answer is that uh, the initiative will be maintained. Uh, the solutioning of, of the tools and process and IT and capabilities that we put forward will likely get mixed a bit differently as we leverage all of the assets from our, our, our two legacy companies. So we're very excited about our customer experience going forward and know that, um, you know, we can unlock a lot of value by making sure that we're providing uh, an industry-leading experience uh, through digital means. Okay. Thanks for all the details and congrats again on the quarter. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to Rich for closing remarks. Well, first, thanks to all of you for uh, joining this morning. Uh, very encouraged with uh, our engagement. I, I would tell you that uh, we're arguably now, you know, 28 days in, and as I look at our business moving forward, I could not be more excited about the opportunities. Uh, that we have in front of us. Uh, the promise of, of being able to serve the business partner ecosystem with more value, the, the promise of being able to drive uh, meaningful uh, returns for our investors and shareholders, our, our insight in becoming clearer to me. As we had stated in the prepared remarks, uh, we had committed in the business case to 25% uh, accretion, 
And as we kind of look at our crystal ball right now, we believe that uh, we will overachieve that goal moving forward. Uh, so our, our future from an overall customer, vendor, co-worker, and investor perspective is quite bright, and I'm very excited about the opportunities. So thanks for your time, and we'll be talking to you soon. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.